me make sure I got the recording started. All right, so welcome to Phenomenal Fish. This is a, a webinar that's going to focus on the natural history of fish, both around the world and in Arizona specifically, um, with a specific emphasis on, on education and educators, um, bringing you some stuff that you can hopefully bring back to your classroom or your teaching situation, whatever that might be. This is actually the third in a series of sort of animal webinars that we've been offering all of June. And we have two more that are that are scheduled to come um, in the following weeks here as well. We'll talk about those in a little bit. First of all, some general housekeeping. As you probably realized, the microphones are muted. Um, you will be interacting with me through either the chat or the Q&A box. It doesn't matter which one you use. A couple of you have already been communicating with me through the chat, and that's perfectly fine. You don't need to use both of them. It doesn't matter which one you use. Um, if you have questions at all during the presentation or you want to um, answer any of the questions, then um, feel free that you can that you can put you can um, put that into the into the chat feature that's in there. If I haven't answered your question at the time that you put it in, just be aware that all questions will be answered by the end. There'll be some time at the end where I will go through and answer the questions. This presentation is being recorded. So if for some reason you have an issue, uh, the, the the network goes down, anything like that, um, it is being recorded. If you, if you have to leave a little bit early, that's fine as well. I eventually do try to get these put onto um, our website, and so they will be available in the library on the website eventually. At the end of the presentation, there's going to be a survey i think it's a pop-up survey and so for that reason a lot of some people don't get the survey and that's perfectly fine if, if when you log out if the, if you don't get the survey that's fine don't worry about it um it, it might be because of pop-up blockers or whatever with this particular software as soon as you log out a survey is supposed to pop up i would appreciate you take a few minutes and answer those questions um it helps us plan for the future shows us how we're doing and then finally within about an hour of this webinar being completed you will get a follow-up email on that email will be a couple will be a link and that link will provide you with um, information for getting your uh, downloading your your certificate for one hour of professional development for those of you that that need that for recertification, as well as a link to resources that are that are discussed in this in this webinar. So if you have um, any of the lessons that we talk about, all that stuff that's going to be in here, you're going to get access to all of them um, after the web after the webinar is completed. And so look for that coming. It's an automated webinar it, uh, email that comes at the um, after the the webinar is completed, about 30 minutes to an hour after it's completed. That's general housekeeping. Let me do some introductions very quickly for those of you that are new here. I do see, I do recognize a, a, a lot of names on here, but there's a few names that I don't recognize. So um, this webinar is being hosted by the Arizona Game and Fish Department. If you are not familiar with who we are, we are a state government agency that is responsible for managing Arizona's wildlife population. So there are more than 800 species of animals that we are responsible for managing and making sure that their populations are doing okay and will continue to be okay from now and into the future. We are not your typical government agency in that we don't take any general taxpayer dollars. So there's nothing from your sales tax or nothing from your um, income tax that comes to us. We operate much more on a user pay model in which the users of the resource are the ones that pay for it. Uh, my name is Eric Proctor, and I'm the Wildlife Education Coordinator for the department. In that role, I like to tell people I work kind of behind the scenes. So I am here to support you as educators. So I provide professional development, much like I'm doing right here, curriculum development, resource development, all those types of things to help you bring wildlife issues and wildlife concepts into your instruction whatever that might be. I've been in this position for about 15 years. Prior to that, I was a former middle school, I was a middle school science teacher, taught seventh grade science in both the, the Littleton School District and the Kyrene School District here in, in Arizona, in the Phoenix Metro area. So that's me. Um, that's enough of the introductions though. Let's talk about fish. That's what we're here for. All fish have two things in common. First, they all live in water. That's a given. Next, they have a backbone. They are vertebrates, just like mammals, reptiles, birds, and amphibians. In fact, it is believed that fish were the first vertebrates on the planet and provided the basic shape and body for millions of species. 
I'm going to show this short little animated graphic as I talk about the evolution of fish. I want to thank Fish Keeping World. They have this graphic as, a, as kind of like an infographic on their website, um, and they've got lots of other information. Um, the only thing that I did was I turned their, their long infographic into this animated graphic so that it could fit into the presentation a little bit better. You'll have access to this later if you want. Um, but again, I, a lot of their credit goes to that. There's no sound on this. I'm going to go ahead and narrate some of it as um, what's going on here. So good. The other thing I should mention, I'm just going to take a quick little aside because I'm seeing some comments come in. Um, so for the webinar, I'm the only one that's administering this. So I am not only um, running the webinar, but I'm also answering the questions or, or following the chat that's going on in here. So if you see, if you hear me um, fade out for a minute, it may be that I'm reading that. Um, also, this is kind of, for the most part, a relatively private webinar, so you're not going to be able to see the other people in here. If you have comments or questions, you direct them to me. I can see all the comments that come up with that. Um, I may address specific people if they have a comment and say, hey, so-and-so is asking this question or anything like that. But um, it's, 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 but basically, you as a participant are kept relatively private from the other ones for the, for this particular format that we're in. All right, so let me um, continue on here then. Again, I'll take this video that from an infographic that Fishing, um, Fishing World put together, and then I just turned it into an animated graphic. The Cambrian explosion is believed to represent the most important evolutionary event in the history of life on Earth. Despite the name explosion, it actually took place over the course of millions of years, starting around 542 million years ago. This is the period when all the major animal body plans appeared. The Cambrian period gave us the first fossils, which are still being found and studied today. Early fish looked nothing like the fish we know today. They did not have jaws vertebrae. These fish, are known, these fish were known as agnatha, meaning fish without jaws. However, they still had mouths and were able to eat. Most of these jawless fish were unable to adapt to the changing world and are now extinct. However, few survive. Lampreys give us a good indication of what these ancient jawless fish might have looked like. The pikau is perhaps the earliest ancestor of fish, appearing about 530 million years ago, although it looked more like a worm than a fish. It had four vital components. I'm going to pause this for just a minute while I talk about this. Um, it had four vital components, which would go on to evolve into a true fish. A head, an obvious head that was separate from the tail. Bilateral symmetry, which means it's the same shape on either side of the body. A V-shaped v muscles and a nerve cord, or what's called a notochord, running down the length of the body. The cord was not protected by a bone or tube, and so therefore, Picau was technically a chordate, not a vertebrate but it did lay the foundations for future vertebrates. It is possible that there were other fish-like creatures that predate these first fish. However, there aren't really reliable fossils that we've been able to, 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 to find yet. By the time we get to the Ordovician period, the backbone had finally formed. Fish were diversifying in shape, length, and size. However, they had still not yet developed jaws. As a result, they couldn't consume large prey. Instead, they most likely would have fed by sucking water and debris through their mouths from the seabed and releasing the waste and water through their gills. Towards the end of the Ordovician and during the beginning of the Silurian period, Earth experienced a colossal extinction the second largest in the extinction events, wiping out approximately 70% of all species. As I said earlier, all fish up to this point have been jawless. Jaws are first recorded in the Silurian period where fossil records found two groups of fish, placoderms and acanthodoids. The jaws are thought to have evolved from the exterior gill arches. It is believed in fact that they may have developed not for eating, but to assist with breathing. Over time, jaws became more intricate and complex. During the late Silurian, both cartilaginous and bony fish developed. The introduction of these two types of fish brought a huge diversification to the sea, and fish of many different shapes and sizes began to take over the waters, which, which leads us to the Devonian period, known as the Age of Fishes. Placoderms were still hanging around. However, the cartilaginous fish, such as sharks and rays, were more agile and started to take over. Meanwhile, the bony fish started breaking into two groups, the ray-finned fish and the lobed-finned fish. These two groups would take dramatically different routes through history. 
The ray finned fish evolved into every water niche on Earth and have now become the most diverse and numerous vertebrates on the planet today. The lobed finned fish eventually grew legs, took to the land, and became the ancestors of most terrestrial or land based vertebrates, including humans. But all was not well. At the end of the next period, the Permian, the Earth experienced its largest mass extinction. Approximately 96% of all marine species were completely wiped out. This extinction brought in what is known as the age of reptiles, made famous for the evolution of dinosaurs. However, the fish that survived, which were mostly the bony fish, continued to evolve alongside these fearful great lizards. This brings us to the present day era, which spans from 65 million years ago to the present. During this time, the megalodon, a humongous 67 foot version of a great white shark evolved and then died off. Fossil records and 3D modeling indicate the megalodon fed on whales with more biting force than a T-Rex. Today, as a result of this dramatic evolutionary history, there are more than 30,000 different types of fish. They represent over half of all living vertebrates. The fish that we know now are the result of thousands of evolutionary changes over millions of years. Starting with no vertebrate and no jaw, these incredible creatures changed and adapted to become better predators and survivors and create thousands of species inhabiting a wide range of waters from the depths as low as 36,000 feet to the ever-changing conditions present in the Amazon rainforest. As I said before, I owe this, this portion of the presentation to Fish Keeping World. Um, the sources you're going to see here in a minute are where all this information came from because everybody asks, hey, where did you get some of that information from? Um, and it is right there. So just to summarize, it is thought that the fish we know today evolved from five main groups of fish, as you can see in this chart. Two of those groups are now completely extinct, and the last one, the bony fish is the largest class of vertebrates and makes up around 95% of all fish on the earth today. As I've mentioned, there is incredible diversity among fish. Fin fish like salmon have gills, are covered in scales, and reproduce by laying eggs. Eels, by contrast, have worm-like bodies and exceedingly slimy skin. Lungfish can gulp air, and whale sharks the largest fish give birth to live young and eat only tiny fish, squid, and plankton. Again, as we go through this presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the, the chat box. Um, and I'll be more than happy to attempt to answer them. Fish have developed special senses too. Because water transmits sounds, disperses chemicals, and conducts electricity better than air, fish rely less on their vision and more on their hearing, taste, and smell. Many can detect motion in the water using a special row of scales with sensors known as the lateral line, which you can see on the Atlantic cod in the upper left-hand corner, that white line that runs down the body, that's actually a sensory organ that helps them sense the world around them. Others, like sharks, can find their prey and even navigate by detecting electrical charges, a process called electroreception. Any churches and living animals create small electrical currents. Electrocardiogram machines take advantage of this to track electricity from your beating heart. Salt water happens to be a good conductor of electricity. Because fish cells have a cha charge different from the water that they're swimming in, they create a weak voltage. Sharks can sense the tiniest changes in this electrical current, down to one billionth of a volt. The source of a shark's electroreception lies around their snouts and lower jaw. If you look closely at a shark's face, which you can see in this picture, you'll see tiny dots around its mouth that look like large blackheads. These vary in number depending on each species' hunting activity. Really active hunting sharks will have 1,500 or more of those dots, while the more sedentary ones only have a few hundred. Those dots are open pores um, filled with an electrically conductive jelly. These pores are actually connected to the shark's lateral line, the same thing that we ta talked about on the Atlantic cod up there. 
Um, this whole system allows sharks to sense water displacement, pressure, and direction of creatures. The shark's sense of smell is actually quite remarkable as well. That becomes its primary prey finding tool. The electroreception doesn't actually kick in until the shark is usually about three feet away from its prey, allowing it to orient its jaws for the final accurate attack. In some cases, sharks are known to roll their eyes back in their head, kind of as a form of protection, before an attack and let their electroreception take over. Quite literally, sharks are wired for hunting. And so Anne actually commented that that's the ampullae of Lorenzi, Lorenzi uh, which is actually, that's what this collection of organs that these, these pores are called. Um, so that's actually really good. Good job. And Evelyn, I'm glad you made it. Um, we're just getting started, sort of. So um, we're just talking about the evolution of fish right now. One reason fish are so diverse is that 70% of the planet is covered in water. From a conservation perspective, this is also one of the challenges. Our oceans are so vast that we have barely touched the surface of their exploration. This is data from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN, an organization that's devoted to understanding the status of nature and how to conserve it. So I took some data that was available on their website and, I, and I've been working with it a little bit. It looks at how many different species from different animal groups have had their status evaluated. So the IUCN has taken a look at how many species have been described, have science said, this is a species that exists, and then how many of those species have had their populations evaluated to determine how well they're doing? Are the populations okay? Are they threatened? Are they endangered? And so on. So this chart, this graph is, is this, it's not a graph, this chart is comparing the number of described species. So basically the total species in that particular group that we've, we've acknowledged exist right now compared to those that we've actually had a chance to scientifically evaluate. Um, the blue column lists the number of species that have been described. Um, notice there, there are more than three times the, the, the fish species over anything else. There are 35,000 fish species that have basically been described. The next closest one is birds at just over 11,000. The orange column shows you the number of species that have been evaluated or have had their kind of their population sort of um, assessed to determine how well they're doing. Um, and you can see the, the key number right there being that only 57% of fish species populations have been evaluated. It is by far the lowest of all the animal groups that, of these ones that we're talking about. It means birds, fish, mammals, and reptiles. No, nothing comes close to only having just over half of their populations evaluated. This means that we don't really have a good grasp of what is happening to our fish species across the world. It is to the point where we can't even give an estimate to the number of species that are, are, that are threatened. And you can see that here showing that uh, both reptiles and fish, we just don't have enough coverage to determine a percentage of the species that are threatened. Recognizing that the data on fish is deficient, there are efforts underway. This map, also from the IUCN and a project they call the River Bank, shows priority assessment locations. The red areas have been listed as high priority for evaluating fish populations. The grayer areas are areas where we've done a pretty good job or we're doing assessments right now, but all those red areas that you can see through South, of South America and um, Asia and Australia, the fit, we really don't have a good handle on the fish populations. But we do have some data. This graph, again, available from the IUCN, highlights the status of different animal groups. For comparison, I just pulled info for fish and then other aquatic organisms. So we could kind of get an idea of where do fish stand in relation to other aquatic type animals. The red bars that you see in the middle of each of the lines, more or less, um, represent our best estimate for the proportion of species that are threatened. So if the bar is more to the right, it means that there's a higher percentage of threatened species. If the bar is more to the left, it means there's a higher percentage of, of safe species, for lack of a, of, of a better term. The gray areas represent the amount of species that we are data deficient on, or we don't have enough data. What types of things do you notice by looking at this graph? If you'll just type in some thoughts of, as you look at this graph and you can see we're looking at cephalopods, which are like your octopi and, and, and squid, selected bony fish, um, crustaceans, sharks and rays, 
reed forming corals, um, uh, crustaceans, and amphibians. What do you notice as you look at the graphs? So Anne mentions that we don't have a lot of data on cephalopods, absolutely. So that's probably gonna be a focus of some of the research that comes in here. Um, they're listed as being relatively safe if you look at the red bars off to the left, but a lot of that is assumptions on um, data that's not quite in tenants there. I look at this graph and I see that in general for what we have on bony fish, you know, we seem to be doing pretty good. It's that they're, they're sharks and rays. There's a lot of data that's still out on sharks and rays. Um, and so their um, population seem to be a little bit more hurting, but some of our bony fish, maybe not as much. Um, a lot of that's probably gonna be with a lot of the data that's coming in from North America and Europe and, and, and some of those that we have a lot of protect, but, but that doesn't mean that all fish are doing okay. This is just looking at, um, some of the some of the bony fish all right so i've given you all right we got some comments reed forming corals are much more vulnerable and then the bonier the better good job i've given you a lot of information i want to step back for a minute and look at what you can do with it how you can incorporate some of this info into your teaching Here's an activity that comes from Project WET. If you're not familiar with Project WET, they're an organization that's focused on educating about water and its conservation around the world. This activity looks at the diversity of fish, but from a very specific perspective. We look at what we call water quality windows. So all water is not alike. Just because you have a lake doesn't mean that, that, that all the water in that lake is the same. Um, fish have very specific conditions that they can live in. They may occupy only a small portion of an entire lake or an ocean as a result of those conditions. These conditions include things like pH, salinity, dissolved oxygen, those types of things. In fact, you've probably done some of these measurements with your students, or if you teach outdoor education, you've probably gone to a pond and, and done some of these water quality assessments. Um, what I like about this activity is it's a great activity to tie those, re those testing results in with what it actually means for wildlife. So in this activity, um, students are assigned a fish species, and you're gonna see this in a minute, they, you're, they're given some information about a fish and the type of water it can live in and then you're supposed to go around to these different water habitats and determine if your fish can live in that particular habitat one is the most ideal one for your fish and then at the end you give them information where that where the habitat changes and they have to determine if their fish could survive so i'm going to show you what this looks like so to do this activity you give them cards so these are the examples of the card the fish cards that the the, the students would get um, and all of these are included in the activity. So you can see here some examples that they have many, many more than what's here. And it's not just fish that they include in here as well. They do include microorganisms and they include um, they include some crustaceans. So there's lobsters and, and some other things in there, but we're focusing on the fish. I just gave you a piece of it. And we're gonna look at one fish in particular. So because rainbow trout are also found in Arizona, I figured I would focus on an Arizona one. And then you can see the four water quality windows that have been put up there. And there's actually more, I think there's about 10 water quality windows. And so the idea is that the kids have to look at their trout, their, their fish, in this case, the trout that I have in the, in the bottom of this page, and then figure out which of these water quality windows, number one, two, three, or four, is the most ideal for this particular trout and so if anybody wants to take a guess and in your in your chat if you'll go ahead and put the um what you think is the best one to fit you're looking at temperature dissolved oxygen and ph and and ideally um all of the parameter ranges much must, must fit within the ranges of the water quality window so the temperature if, if the rainbow trout is 10 to 24 that means that it has to fit entirely in that one with the water if the water goes too high or too low you, you could risk having some survival issues for your for your particular fish and so ellen asked she said what is this um age group for this one that's that's a good question i'd have to take another look i think this is for elementary age kids um obviously they just have to be able to understand what these terms are so if you've introduced temperature dissolved oxygen ph um other than that it's, it's really just a critical thinking a comparison activity um and so i would say probably elementary probably um probably the middle elementary you could probably do this with again depending on the on the vocabulary you've introduced third fourth fifth sixth grade probably in there All right, so let's take a look at what you guys have put in here. We've got a, a lot of different guesses saying um, everything from one, two, and three. It doesn't look like anybody put four down that I can read. 
Um, so the way, again, you do this is you take a look at the temperature and the temperature, a rainbow trout can tolerate 10 to 24 degrees Celsius. So we want to look at all each of these things. Number one, um, it, it has a much wider range, four to twenty-two, and that's the wa That's what the range is going to be on that water qual on that on that particular water. If the if the trout was in there, he could potentially be experiencing waters that go down to four degrees, um, and that's not going to be survivable for this particular rainbow trout. So actually, one isn't going to fit because the range the range is actually too large of a window for this particular one. Um, water quality window um, number two has a ten to twenty-eight. Um, and actually doesn't doesn't go line that's going to go a little bit high on this end um a little bit so it's going to be a little bit hot might might be an issue other one is 10 to 32 and then we have 1 to 34 so of those the closest is probably going to be 1 2 or 3 um four, 4 goes a little bit too high and a little bit too low um and it's also salt water you can see it's salinity um which rainbow trout wouldn't survive in so then we have to go to the next one and see dissolved oxygen and we look at the dissolved oxygen is 8.4 to 11.3 and we can start going through here and once you start going through this and then you would do the the, the ph i'm not going to go through each and every one of these but in general according to the activity they actually believe that it would be water quality window number two would be the, the most ideal for this one um largely probably looking at the ph on, on a lot of those is going to make the difference so in this case they say two but i'm sure again depending on your teaching style you could have the students um justify their reasons and so on. Now, once they've done this and each each student might get a different fish that they're involved in and they're gonna be standing by their particular water quality window. So you're gonna have a few different fish under, under different water qualities. Um, what you're gonna do then is you're gonna read them a scenario. In this case, you would say a severe drought has hit the entire region that the organisms live in, from the highest mountains to the open oceans. With the drought, the temperatures have hit record highs while the precipitation levels are at record lows. The water temperatures of the freshwater rivers and lakes in the region have risen dramatically. For over two weeks, the freshwater temperatures have consistently stayed at the highest temperature of each water quality window. For example, the water temperature for water quality window number two, which is the one we're sitting in, now sits at 28 degrees Celsius and has been there for a few weeks. Based on this info, do you think the trout would be able to survive? So they would have to think about that. And then you say, what would the trout need to do? At, what would it need to do? And likely what's going to happen is they're going to start talking about how it might need to find new water sources if that's possible, if it's connected by a river and so on. And then you can start talking about the changes of what happens if it moves to that new water source. What's the what's the impact of this trout now moving into this new area on the fish or the other organisms that were already in there that had stayed there? So you start to talk about the environmental impact of the of these types of, of things on there. So just again, another quick activity talking about um, that and now we're going to talk about another activity um, that that I've been doing for a long time at workshops. This is one of my favorite ones to do at a workshop um, because I think it it gets to a lot of creativity. It's an activity that we call fashion a fish. It's a modification of an activity that came out of Project Wild, but in this case, students are going to analyze different adaptations that fish might have um, once they've. So they're going to look at potential and I'm going to show you this in a minute they're going to look at different adaptations and why fish might have those adaptations once you've gone through that then they're going to look at native fish and they're going to try to identify those adaptations in those native fish um, and attempt to give you some information about the native so if they look at a native fish and they realize that it has a certain color pattern or that it has a it has a hump on its back um, that's going to tell them a little bit about the habitat that this fish might live in so they're going to be able to describe the types of habitat that these fish might live in based on the adaptations they can see. And then the final sort of assessment for this activity is the students get to be creative and they get to draw a picture of a fish. In this case, you 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 sell it to them as they've just discovered a new fish. They have to describe the fit, they have to, they have to draw the fish, they have to describe it. Um, ideally, they draw it in its habitat. You tell them that it has to include at least one or two of the adaptations we've talked about. Um, and then they have to create a name for it so you can get into scientific versus common naming conventions and go into all of that. But let me give you an idea of what, what, what's included in this. So when we talk about, they have to have to discuss the different adaptations. What they're gonna get is they're gonna get sheets like this. Um, and these could be big sheets that you put on the board or they can be hand that you give them and so we talk about some potential body shapes that fish might have and this is just some of them these are five of different body shapes the fish might have so in small groups the students would be working on this and they would say okay why would a fish have a humpback what would get what would be the advantage of that and you can actually see a picture of the humpback there there's a humpback chub in the in the 
um, lower right hand corner. Uh, why would they have a flat belly? Why would they be torpedo shaped? Why would they have a vertical um, setup? So that so they talk about this and give what what are the advantages that this particular fish um, would have for it? Ellen wants to know why the horizontal fish looks so sad. Um, I have no idea. Maybe because he doesn't have. I, I don't think think we see a lot of those fish here in Arizona. So maybe he's he's sad that he doesn't have as many as friends as he does. Um, <laughs> normally so this is an example of um body shape and so some of the other adaptations you look at is coloration and so you can talk about the different color patterns that fish might have why would they be dark on the top and bottom on the light why would they have a mottled or a speckled pattern like our our speckled dace that's over there on the right hand side why would they have horizontal stripes why would they have vertical stripes what are the benefits that these different things have so again your students discuss these with the key part being there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer some of these adaptations might exist for more than one reason but you're trying to get at their critical thinking and why would they have this um, and then that's going to tell them a little bit about their habitat. And the final one we're going to talk about just briefly again is mouth design. This is just another example. Um, why would they have these different types of mouths? Um, these elongated jaws or the duck-billed jaws, extremely large jaws, or why do they have the sucker-shaped jaw like the little Colorado sucker that you see on the right-hand side? Um, and so they can do that. They, once you've gone through this and you've discussed the, all these different adaptations, that's when, again, you give them pictures of native fish and you have them try to identify, find things in those pictures of those native fish. What, you know, oh, I noticed this one has a sucker mouth or I noticed this one's torpedo shaped or um, this is very vertical. Um, and so they can try to, and then that tells them a little bit, and then they get to draw and have some fun with it. Like I said, I do this with teachers all the time and, and it's, a, it's a blast to see what the teachers come up with as, as far as their, their designs. Um, so cool. So I've spent a lot of time talking about fish in general. Now I want to focus on Arizona. For this part, I, again, I'm gonna I'm pulling from resources here. I'm not reinventing the wheel. So um, I, I leaned heavily on the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum's book, The Natural History of the Sonoran Desert. If you're not familiar with that book, I highly encourage you to check it out. They put a lot of it online um, from their website to, to get natural history of information. Very, very good information. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the fish in there. Since Arizona is often defined as an arid desert, fish aren't always what people associate with our state. Yet we could be home to nearly 100 species of fish, of which more more than 30 are native that range in size from the small top minnow, which may only be a couple inches long, to the Colorado pike minnow, which has what you see there on the upper left hand corner, um, which um, has historical measurements of six feet long. At least two thirds of these native species are listed as threatened or endangered by either the state or the federal government. There are a number of factors that have led to declining fish populations in the state. These include the introduction of exotic competitors, dams, drought, and overuse of water resources. The Colorado River, which defines the Southwest, is an excellent example. The Colorado River Basin contains more endemic freshwater fish species than any other river basin in North America. Some are large animals, remarkably well adapted to the swiftly moving waters of the Colorado. Adaptations common to the three so-called big river species listed um, are reduced or embedded scales and a bizarre hump occurring just behind the head. Um, apparently that's an adaptation that helps the fish maintain its position in swift currents by pushing it down toward the river bottom. So there's the answer for that one that you were looking at before. Originating high in the Rocky Mountains, the Colorado drains seven North American states. Watershed encompasses 242,000 square miles before it reaches, on a good day, the Gulf of California, some 10,000 feet lower in elevation. The river has a fascinating history of human use over the last 10,000 years that includes fishing, farming, mining, and even steamboat transport. Today, it is of major commercial importance, providing electric power, water for irrigated crops, recreation, um, for and, and 20 million people rely on it, of which only around 2.5 million actually live in the river basin itself. By the time the river reaches the Gulf, the water has been claimed by farmers, power companies, Indian nations, and both the U.S. and Mexican governments. Combined, the capacity of agricultural and municipal diversions actually exceeds the average annual flow of the river through Lee's Ferry. 
which is in northern Arizona. In the last seven decades, a series of massive dams has been created to regulate the flow of the Colorado River. Since dams create physical barriers to aquatic wildlife and severely alter the characteristics of the river's flow, natural seasonal changes in flow and water temperature are virtually eliminated. Instead, flow is regulated by electric power demands. Water for power generation is often drawn from the bottom of the reservoir. Waters from the bottom tend to be cold and temperatures are fairly constant. At times, closed dams can shut off all downstream flow. Many of the introduced fishes in, evolved in quieter waters and could be considered pre-adapted for life in reservoirs above dams, whereas native fish tend to do poorly or leave areas where great physical or chemical modifications have occurred. Many non-natives have flourished as a result. Thus, human modification and stabilization of rivers and construction of reservoirs set the stage for establishment of an exotic fish fauna. So this resource, which I'm sure you guys are looking at saying, what the heck is that? I can't read a darn thing on it. Um, this is a resource that I found in my files when I first came to start working at the department 15 years ago. Um, it shows a chronology of fish in Arizona. Um, so it shows the years that some of the natives went extinct and years when exotic were introduced. It's a wealth of information, but it's incredibly difficult to use because of its format. Because it's so large, because um, the data, there's so much data, the text is really small in order to get it to fit on a regular sheet of paper. Um, it doesn't work very well. It, it, it's just dated. The data is not really available anymore. I mean, all I have is this chart. Um, so. Despite looking at this chart for about 15 years, trying to figure out what I was going to do with it, I finally figured out what I was going to do. So I took that same information. Oops, so there you can see a zoomed in version of the chart, just so if you couldn't see what it's doing is showing you at the top of the different species. Not all of them are, are native. And then there's a timeline running down the left hand side, which shows you like, um, for example, the 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 Gila trout, the second one right there, shows that it was reintroduced in 1974. That's what that little symbol means, and you can see that from the key. Um, so, so that's what it's showing you. So I took that information, I created a different chart, and then I animated it, much like I had done the chart before, the, the, the infographic you saw before from Fishing World. I'm just going to play a little bit of it. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. All this does is it scrolls slowly to the left. Um, but what I think is this this has incredible classroom potential is students could pause it at certain points to analyze data. Imagine students working with a timeline of major events like the completion of dams along the Colorado River or the introduction of certain species and seeing if there is any correlation to declines in native populations. I encourage you when we're done here to spend a little time on your own with this video to see how it might be used in your own instruction. So you can see it just scrolls through here a little bit. The, the blue ones on the left hand side that are slowly going off the screen, those are the native fish and then the yellow ones are the non-native introduction so you can see when approximately when they were introduced um, so some cool little stuff in there and again you're seeing it through a presentation it's going to be a slightly better quality um, i'm using what's available to me um, and so i don't have the raw data behind this i just have these charts that existed so i just tried to find a way to animate them so you can see that there i'm going to go ahead and move on now um, here is another activity um, this one allows you to look at the history of fish in Arizona, what we've just been talking about, and allows for some more critical thinking. In this case, we are looking at fish through the eyes of Arizona's early explorers. I have found some historical journal entries that relate to fish. Often, though, these entries are not very straightforward. They are often seeing an these explorers are often seeing animals for the first time, so they relate them to animals that they are already familiar with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of journal entries. You can see one there. Um, and you're going to take a stab at this. You're going to try to figure out. And I know your, your knowledge of native fish may be somewhat limited. That's OK. We're, we're not. There's no pressure here. I'm not grading you. Um, and so th there's there's nothing related to that at all. I'm, I'm just going to take we're, I'm going to show you the fish that that he's describing that this person's describing. Um, and then we're going to try to figure out if you can guess what fish what native fish he actually might have been describing because the fish he's talking about in this case salmon trout we don't have salmon trout in arizona so he must have been talking about something else but he was referencing salmon trout because that's what he was familiar with and this fish that he saw reminded him of salmon trout um so we'll just take a quick stab at this again for your students perspective they would have the time to research this a little bit we're just i'm just giving you a, a taste of what this could be so here's the first one in 1846 captain philip st george cook was tasked with leading an expedition to find a wagon road that connected santa fe new mexico to san diego california 
at the San Pedro River in his what in what is now southeastern Arizona, he wrote, quote, fish are abundant in this pretty stream. Salmon trout are caught by the men in great numbers. I have seen them 18 inches long. A day later, he continued his description. An abundance of fine fish are caught, some that are three feet long. They are said to be salmon trout. As I've mentioned, um, he mentions you know salmon trout at least twice in his thing, but we don't have salmon trout in Arizona, never have. Um, so we have to get an idea of what, what do we mean by salmon trout. Um, to do that, we can look at another famous explorer. This is a, a journal entry from William Clark from the famous Lewis and Clark expedition. Obviously, they didn't go through Arizona, but they did describe salmon trout, and he actually has a full description of salmon trout, and that's his illustration of salmon trout. Um, Based on this and what little information you might have, again, normally I would show you some pictures of some fish and, and or, or you would have done some research. Any thought on what type of fish he might have been describing if he wasn't describing salmon trout in the 1840s? Any idea what he might have been describing? So we have some guesses for rainbow trout and brown trout. Apache trout. So good. So what's interesting is you guys are getting on the trout theme because trout and salmon are closely related. In fact, trout is a type of um, salmonid in the same family. Um, we didn't have rainbow trout and brown trout. Those aren't native to Arizona. So that it wouldn't have been those. It potentially could have been rainbow trout or Apache trout, but Apache trout have a very distinct appearance that probably wouldn't in here. Carol actually pointed out that she thinks it might be the Colorado pike minnow. Um, and so let's put up a picture. This is a picture of the Colorado pike minnow, and I just happened to set it up very similar. We're not 100% certain. This is one of those where we don't know, but given the sizes that he's describing, three feet long, if he's accurate, there weren't many fish that got that big. And so we have to think about that. So we think that the, the probably most likely we're talking about the, the Colorado pike minnow, which is the largest minnow. Um, and like I said, it can get up to, to um, sizes of six feet. Um, when it would be in the in the actual Colorado River, it would get quite big. So we think that this might be the Colorado pike minnow. Again, just a little bit of analysis, but we're do the kids are becoming historians at this point. They're reading through things and they're having to extrapolate information from there. Let's take another shot. So this is um, in 1850, John R. Bartlett was sent to the region to help determine the southern boundary of the United States. While exploring the Gila River in what is now central Arizona, he wrote, a number of fish were brought in today by the Mexicans resembling the buffalo fish of the Mississippi. And here's a picture of a buffalo fish. There, there's different types of buffalo fish. This is just one type. They drove them into a small nook in a laguna nearby and then rushed into the water and killed them with poles. I ate of them at dinner, but found them soft and unpalatable. So again, um, <laughs> what what you have in, in, in your description, and if you know anything about native fish, that's a buffalo fish you see pictured. We don't have native buffalo fish. So what might Bartlett have been describing? Any thoughts or ideas? We get some guesses here. I did like um, Brendan made the comment that he's a typical fisherman, prone to exaggeration, probably talking about the three foot um, fish that we're saying. What we do see in a lot of these historical things, especially if you follow um, some of the early trappers that came through, that they were prone to exaggeration. And, and while we get some valuable information from their journals, you also have to be able to evaluate them in light and say, OK, where is he being reasonable? Where is he exaggerating? And so on. So a lot of people are saying carp, sucker, or chub. Um, going in here, this one's a pretty more well-defined that we actually think that he was probably describing the, the Razorback sucker. And we're actually going to become visiting the rainbow, the Razorback sucker in a, in a minute here um, with another, um, I'm going to talk about our hatcheries a little bit and the role that they might play in here. Again, this is an activity you can download from the website that, that you'll get a link to at the end. There are additional examples aside from the two that I just included, just giving you a taste of this. Um, but the idea is that the students would be given some time to research native fish to help them draw their conclusions and, and become these historians. All right, so trout fishing is big in Arizona. We actually have seven species that you can fish for, two native trout and then five that have been introduced. Yet most trout in Arizona do not originally come from the stream, river, or lake where you caught it, but rather it was stocked from a hatchery at some stage of its life. Natural trout reproduction in Arizona is extremely limited, yet angler demand is high. 
Trout cannot reproduce on lakes or ponds because they require cold, clear-running perennial streams. Thus, the vast majority of trout caught in Arizona's public waters originate from hatcheries. The department has operated fish hatcheries since 1922 and currently maintains six within the state, each of which has a dedicated source of natural spring water. Five of these fish hatcheries are used for cold water production and play a major role in providing trout fishing opportunities in Arizona. The sixth hatchery is dedicated to warm water fish production and things like bass and stuff like that. Almost all of the trout harvested in Arizona are stocked from our hatcheries. The impact of these hatcheries cannot be overstated. Every year, department fish hatcheries contribute to the state economy by producing, on average, 385,000 pounds of fish, which equates to over 3 million fish that are stocked into more than 100 locations around the state. These fish hatcheries are destined our destination facilities for bird watchers and the general public as well. Thousands of tourists annually visit the, the hatcheries to learn about the fisheries program and the department's mission. These also help the local communities around these fishing destinations. According to the a 2013 economic impact of fishing in Arizona analysis, annual recreational sport fishing produces $1.47 billion dollars in economic benefits for the state of Arizona. 1.4 billion. There are more than 350,000 anglers that spend almost a billion dollars on equipment and trip-related expenditures annually in Arizona. Sport fishing also generates more than 20,000 full and part-time jobs. Hatcheries play a vital role in maintaining the quality of sport fishing in Arizona. Raising trout is a public service supported not from income taxes, but exclusively from revenues generated by anglers under the user pay, user benefit model that I mentioned at the beginning. When you buy a fishing pole or a lure, when you buy a fishing license, any of that stuff is money that comes back to the department for the management of these fish and to, for these hatcheries. What's cool of it, and there you can see a picture of our, our truck that goes out, um, and then uh, there's a, a picture of the, the fish being stocked into one of our urban lakes there. You can actually get our stocking schedule from our website. This tells you the weeks when we will be putting trout and other fish into the different waterways. So here's an example. The one on the top is a portion of our statewide stocking, so our big statewide lakes, things like uh, Watson Lake, those types of things. And then the one in the lower right is our urban lake or, or what's, what's called our community fishing waters program. So the ones that are like in, in Phoenix, in Tucson, in Payson, those, um, those sort of city lakes, those more urban lakes, what, the stocking schedule for those. We're not gonna give you the exact date that we fish but you can that we're going to put the fish in the lake but you get a rough idea of when they're going to be there so you can plan fishing around that as well so this leads me to another activity at least one that could work if you return to in-person classes and or have the ability to take students on field trips i highly recommend visiting a fish hatchery there are three located in the sedona cottonwood area two that are near payson and one up near sholo and pine top those are the state ones there's also some federal ones we actually have someone on here whose husband works for the federal one out at willow beach there's one on the colorado river that's a federal one there's one up on on the reservation so there are some other hatcheries the state maintains six of them um, two actually have visitor centers, Page Springs and Tonto Creek have visitor centers that you can go in and you can visit and you can, um, they have some exhibits that you can walk around. They're not super huge, but they, but they do have some stuff. Um, and many have areas beyond the hatchery itself where you can view other wildlife and nature. So you can walk around, you can take a birding hike, you can do all different types of stuff. So you don't have to come just for the fish hatchery. You can incorporate other activities into your field trip if you're aware. Please be aware, however, that because of current COVID restrictions, we aren't really taking visitors at these locations right now. So this is something to keep on your radar in the future. If you are looking for potential field trip opportunities in the future, I highly encourage you to go check out what a, what a, what a hatchery might be able to provide. Um, sometimes you may even be able to get somebody to speak with you. If you, if you call them ahead of time, they, they might, depending on their schedule, they might be able to chat with you and you can learn a little bit about how the whole process works. Um, let's take a little bit of a, a, a different look at a different hatchery. The Aquatic Research and Conservation Center is a different kind of fish hatchery. It's located in Cornville, right next to our Page Springs hatchery. The ARC has operated since the early 2000s with the goal of supporting native fish conservation. One of its projects is to better understand how to reestablish native fish populations from hatchery-raised fish. 
Unlike traditional stocking, where fish are stocked and later caught by anglers, the goal of stocking endangered native fish is to ensure they survive long term and reestablish the populations in the wild. Many hatcheries are designed to grow fish and to do it as quickly as possible to provide anglers the opportunity to catch fish quickly. Typically, fish are raised in environments most conducive to high growth and survival, but this environment is extremely dissimilar to the wild conditions. When stocked, these hatchery raised fish are naive to predators. They're unprepared to find and capture their own food. They're unaware of wild environments and seasonal variations, and they're unable to swim fast and long enough to maintain station and flowing water. Because they are naive, hatchery fish, fish have notoriously low long-term survival rates. Again, when the goal is to supply fish to be caught by anglers, that's normally not a problem. However, when the goal of a stocking effort is conservation, survival of hatchery raised fish in the wild becomes very important. Nowhere is this more evident than with the repatriation efforts for native desert fishes, particularly for the razorback sucker, which we just mentioned earlier, and the bony tail chub in the lower Colorado River. These two species were once common throughout the Colorado River Basin. As I've already mentioned, construction of dams, habitat modification, and introduction of non-native fish species have imperiled these fish. Conservation efforts include an aggressive fish augmentation program, stocking more than a half a million of each fish over the course of, the, of 50 years. Despite the massive stocking efforts, very few fish survive from year to year. One characteristic of the lower Colorado River prior to dam construction was its brownish red color. This part of the Colorado is at the end of a long 1500 mile journey, which before dam construction gave the water plenty of time to accumulate sediment. Dam construction blocked much of the sediment, clearing up the water. Clear water is the perfect environment for species such as striped bass and largemouth bass, not natives. They rely on their eyes to find unsuspecting fish. On the other hand, razorback suckers and bony-tailed chub, which evolved in the muddy pre-dam river, haven't developed the appropriate predator avoidance behaviors to survive well in the post-dam environment. And since razorback suckers and bony-tailed chub are hatchery raised, they are naive to the threat of predation by these non-native fish. So what can we do about it? What are your thoughts? How could we solve this problem? We have fish that we're raising in hatcheries, but they don't know how to be wild fish. Put it, put your thoughts on there about some ideas that you might have on how you would, how you could potentially solve this problem. And then I'm gonna tell you what we're actually doing. I'm gonna go back and read some comments here that have come in as well. So your thoughts, how do we solve this problem of, of hatchery raised native fish not knowing how to be wild? So we have some some good guesses in here. We have um, release them as eggs rather than live fish so that they learn right there, replicate the conditions they will face in the wild, uh, using mechanized predators. Some are put into a lagoon um, and ponds, give them more turbulent muddy water. Make the fish become a school of fish so they can learn from each other. Some good ideas. All right. So that, all lots of lots of good ideas. Researcher, um, what we're using is Botox and a blender. Researcher using these two items to develop methods for training large groups of naive native fish to recognize catfish and bass as predators. They are trying to condition them in the for life in the wild. And some of you are like, what? Let's explain this a little bit. Let's start with the blender. When a fish gets nipped by a predator and its skin breaks, it releases a special pheromone into the water. This acts as an alarm that alerts the other fish of danger. The blender is used to extract this pheromone from the skin of razorback suckers and bony tailed chub. The pheromone serves as an olfactory warning, but that's not enough. So you put that you can put the the the, the blended up um fish pieces with that pheromone in there into the water so they start to recognize this danger signal. But that's not enough. You can't just put untrained prey fish into a tank with predators, drop some pheromones into the tank, and expect them to survive. 
they need something else. And that's where the Botox comes in. To prevent the predators from eating the prey fish while they are being trained, researchers inject key jaw muscles in the predators with Botox. This temporarily paralyzes the muscles that allow for rapid jaw opening. The predators can swim freely, they can res res respirate normally, and they can even feed on small food pellets that are provided during the research. They can't, however, open their mouth quickly enough to capture fish, no matter how hard they try. So what they'll do is we'll put the prey, the, we'll put the predators in there with the prey species. The predators will act like predators trying to eat the fish, but they won't know how. At the same time, we'll release this pheromone, which serves as an alarm, so that the fish will start to be conditioned to associate the pheromone to the predator and also start to learn that, hey, this guy is dangerous. I need to start swimming away from him. This research is still ongoing, yet initial results are promising. Researchers have observed that in every combination of predator and prey, survival increased when the prey fish were trained. This is great news for razorback suckers and bony tailed chub, and potentially for a whole suite of native fish species that rely on conservation stocking. So this, this research was actually featured in an article that appeared in our award-winning Arizona Wildlife Views magazine. I've taken that article and I've made it available at three different lexiles. This means that it can be accessible to students with different reading levels, even within your same class. So if you have kids that aren't reading at the same level, you can still give them the same article, but it's at a, a level that's appropriate for them. This is another great way to bring wildlife into your classroom and increase literacy at the same time. Each of the articles also includes text dependent questions modeled after ones that they will see on standardized tests. So they're also getting some test taking skills built in there as well. Okay, so we're almost done. Um, however, before we sign off, I wanted to share some action items, some things that you can do to make a tangible difference in the lives of fish in Arizona or wherever you may be. First, as educators, you are in a unique position. You have the opportunity to reach many, many people with your actions. Accept this role and use it. Continue to learn about fish and then spread the word about them. What I have found, I, I used to enjoy putting fish into my lessons because I found that of all the animals that are out there, it seems to be the one that that um, levels the playing field the most. You're always going to have that kid in your classroom who's, who, who at least claims he's an expert on birds or that she claims she's an expert on snakes or whatever it might be. And they're going to sometimes dominate the conversation or they're going to have an advantage if you're talking about particular things. There's a lot of people that go fishing, but not as many kids I found sit there and say, oh, I know everything there is to know about fish. They don't claim to be experts on fish. So it's like you can teach a lot of the same lessons you were going to do, but in the context of fish, and it levels the playing field for everyone. So I really like using fish as that example. Um, and so I encourage you to start incorporating, finding ways to incorporate fish into whatever your teaching might be. Some other things that you can do, obviously I've mentioned it before, buy a fishing license. Um, when you buy a fishing license, even if you're not, don't plan on going fishing, that money's coming directly back to the department and, and it goes to these types of programs. You can also volunteer. There are there are organizations out there um, that that focus on specific fish species where you can go out and you can help habitat improvement projects and things like that. Don't release pets. This is a big one that we have is not releasing your, your own goldfish into the waters, um, turtles, things like that. Pets are not wild animals. They should not be released into into, into the, the waterways and then disposing of waste properly. This includes your fishing gear, um, your your fishing line. Don't don't leave that out there if it breaks off. Try to recover that because that's dangerous for not only other fish, but eagles and other types of things and any sort of trash. Plastic is a big issue with fish. We all know that type of stuff. So these are just some of the things that you can do um, immediately um, when you're done here. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. I do recognize um, there are a lot of questions in here that I'm going to go back and, and review now. But if you have questions, now's the time to put them in into here. I'm going to give you some time. While I do that, I want to talk quickly. I just want to wrap up some things um, to get more. There's the site where you're going to get fish resources, but you don't need to worry about writing it down right now. It is going to come in the email um, that, that that you get in about an hour. Um, if you want to stay in touch, we do have a fake a Facebook page. You can find us with Focus Wild. Focus Wild is the name of our of our education program that that focuses on wildlife education. And you can also sign up for our e news. The department operates a, a variety of electronic newsletters. Um, the one for educators is on there as well. But so there's there's like ten or fifteen that you can that you could choose to sign up for. Education being one of them. Um, if you if you enjoyed this, we have some other upcoming webinars. Um, there's two more in this series. I actually added one. I, I was going to end it at, at the bird one next week, but because these have been so popular, I've decided to not leave reptiles out. So I've added another one on remarkable reptiles. So the next two Wednesdays, there's going to be two more webinars just like this one, but focused on um, topics. And then I've just started adding some other webinars going in.
July. Right now, we're going to be focusing, since July, and a lot of teachers are going to be focusing on what the next school year is going to be looking like. We want to make sure that we're highlighting some of the resources and things that you can do, especially in this uncertain world where you don't know how much is going to be in-person class, how much is going to be online. We want to show you that we have these digital resources that are available to you that can be used in the classroom, but they can also be tools that your students can use at home. So if you're looking for opportunities. So we've got three. Um, the first one is just going to be promoting our learning from home resources. So we're going to be going through our website and um, showing you kind of the, the resources that we think could be valuable for to, to assign your kids at home or, or wherever that might be. And then we've got two more that were popular earlier, um, focusing on using live webcams, how your kids can watch animals from, from the comfort of their home or for the comfort of your classroom, and how you can use that to study animal behavior. And then we're going to be talking about citizen science, specifically how to use apps like iNaturalist and those types of things. So those are some upcoming webinars. You can see in the blue box there how to sign up for them. You'll also get that information on the on the email that's going to come out. So um, don't worry about that too much. And then I'm going to leave this slide up there. If you don't get a question in before I have to log out, um, that's the that's my email address. That's the best way to reach me. And there's also our website and Facebook page again. So with that, I'm going to mute my microphone for a minute while I look through the questions and comments that have already come through. And then if you have additional questions, now is the time to start getting those in there. If you're done and you don't need to listen to the questions, feel free to log out. That's perfectly fine. It is now right about three o'clock. So we got that one done right in an hour. So I'm going to go ahead and mute for just a minute while I while I review some of the comments and questions. So thanks, guys. So a couple comments have come through. We have one of our participants, Ricky, says her actually her husband actually works at one of the the federal um, hatcheries at Willow Beach, and so they raise rainbow sucker uh, rainbows and razorback suckers there. So th um, th that's another hatchery that's available to you. So if you're over in the, I, I don't know the visitation rules on that, but if you're over in the Havasu and that area in the western Arizona, that might be a better option for you. Um, the other one then um ellen actually mentioned she was talking about the journal entry and she said this would be fun to expand this into ela and have the kids write journal entries um as explorers and describing what they might see um and absolutely there's actually a piece of that i just showed you a segment one of the things that i have in that activity that you're going to find um, when you download it because somebody asked where it's available it is available on that link that's going to be you're, you're going to have a whole bunch of resources related to fish that are on there um, and you're going to look for the, the activity that says understanding historical journals or something like that one of the activities is you give the kids an animal that they then have to describe and then you take that description and you give it to another group of kids and then you give them other pictures of animals one is the picture of the animal that they described plus other animals and they have to try to figure out which one they're describing and so it also it's, it's a good science one too because it talks about um the importance of being very specific with your writing and understanding that other people are going to be using your information so how are you very specific because a lot of kids will say oh it 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 you know they'll, they'll have a, a description that's that's very specific to an individual oh it's it's standing on one foot and then they don't realize that um, that's just a behavior that this particular animal is exhibiting at this moment, but it's not really helpful in the in the grand scheme of trying to identify what that animal is. Um, so yeah, there are some some good good things in there. So so thanks for that, Ellen. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, somebody asked about the the hatcheries. Can you visit them right now? And I, I think I addressed that. Is that right now? I believe that they're closed. Um, so you'll just want to keep that in mind. Uh, when the fish are stocked in Tempe Town, like the place is loaded with osprey and even bald eagles. Absolutely, they're, they're also loaded with people. Usually, people kind of figure out when the trucks start to show up or, or whatever, and they like to be the first ones to catch. A lot of times. Um, and Robert says, Bony Tail and Razorback were raised at the Phoenix Zoo, which was a game and fish bass hatchery prior to the zoo, and I believe the 20s and 30s. And he's actually absolutely correct. I have another activity that I haven't been able to use as much, but we have old historic photos of um, the 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 Phoenix Zoo when it was a when it was a bass hatchery. All those ponds were put in to raise bass, um, and you, we actually have maps and, and photos, and the kids have to 
to the site and try to identify things from where the photos some of the original houses so ruby's house which was that that elephant um and there was that that used to be the caretaker's house and there's still some elements in the front pond in front of the pool in front of the zoo that are still elements of the original bass hatchery so there's really some cool history that's involved in there um so lots of good stuff i'm reading through some of the comments people thought the story on the um botox was kind of funny uh being a creative thinker absolutely that shows you what i like about that article is it shows um the creativity that's involved in science and the problem solving that's involved in science um that is a link that you'll be getting available lisa actually works with uh Bill Stewart, um, who's one, who was the author of that original article, or one of those articles. Um, we have uh, Bill Stewart, who does a lot of our, who did some fish research with us, um, is now with uh, Bureau of Reclamation. Let me see if I've got... And Jim, I, I see your comment about um, getting into some more detail. And absolutely, if you want to um, share anything you want to share with me, absolutely. This was intended just to be an overview, but there's absolutely a lot of reasons where we could do um, a, a lot more in detail. Um, and then where do we get those articles? That's that's already going to be in the email that you should be getting, Ellen, um, probably in the next 20 minutes or so. And let me see if you have any other questions, feel free to get them in. I'm going to just make sure that we don't have... Anything else that I am missing? Ellen asked if they're, oh, the past webinars, yes. Um, so there were two more in the series that have already happened. The one on amphibians, which was in conjunction with Amphibian Week, and then the one on mammals that we just did last week. Those were recorded. Um, if you absolutely need them right away, I can probably send you the link to those. But usually what I do is, is within a couple months, I will have them on our website. The reason it takes me so long is I actually edit them down a little bit. I don't edit the content out specifically, but what I do is I edit out the, the stuff that's not um, that's not timely right like the stuff where i'm talking about the upcoming workshops i take all that stuff out um so that it can just be a permanent fixture on our website where it just talks about the fish and all that stuff is taken out so i do a little bit of editing and then i get those on the website my goal is to get a bunch of these new ones up on the website for the beginning of the school year so they're available for teachers to access as well so great um i think that is it i'll stay on for another couple minutes i'll just mute my microphone if you have anything else feel free to, to put them to put them in the chat otherwise you can send me an email Thanks for coming out, guys. I'll be on for another minute or two.